Hello! Welcome to another adventure. Uh, <laughs> we had an adventure getting going today. Had some trouble with the microphones, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, and let me know if at some point throughout the broadcast that changes. Um, we usually have me on a lavalier mic. Today we're using the overheads because the lavalier was not working for the stream. So definitely speak up and let me know in chat if uh, there are any issues with being able to hear me at all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, with the normal opening for the show. Um, today uh, we're exploring the August Deeds Civil War collection. Um, in particular, this is the American Civil War uh, that is being referred to in that title. Um, this is episode 9 of Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Um, and before we dive into the collection, uh, just a couple of acknowledgments. We acknowledge the Tutelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tutelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation, at any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to these souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university in accordance with the university's efforts to transform an historic location into a site for the interpretation of the African-American experience on campus and in the region. Thank you for taking a moment with me to acknowledge the history of the land on which <clears throat> I physically am present at the moment. Um, considering that we're looking at archival materials here, I think uh, acknowledging the history is important. So today, we're going to look at some historical items uh, from the August Dietz Civil War collection. And I have not had a chance to look at any of this myself previous to this broadcast, so this will all be new for me. Um, there's a lovely little bio in the, in the collection here, so I'll probably start by reading that for you all. Hopefully everybody is having a good day today so far. Um, I'm going to switch over so you can see the bio while I'm reading it, because I find that it's easier for me if I'm reading along with things. So let's go over to the document focus here. And you should be able to see that. I will try and zoom in a little bit for you here. Scooch this down a little bit. How is everybody doing today? Feel free to chat in the chat if you are so inclined. Happy to see anybody that stops by. So August Dietz Sr., 1869 to 1963, born in Windecken in Hessen-Nassau, Germany in 1867. Hi Hannah! Uh, August Dietz was brought to the United States in 1871 when his parents immigrated. The family settled in Richmond, Virginia in 1873. He attended local Richmond schools until the age of 14 and realized his real skill was in drawing. Dietz took his first job at the printing firm of A. Hohen and Company, Lithographers, at 11th and Main Street, Richmond, Virginia in 1883 as a helper at a salary of $1.50 for a 66-hour work week. So I know we... Last week, we, we mentioned there was, uh, in the journal, there were tables of wages, um, and they seemed low by today's standards. 
Here we have 66 hours of work for $1.50. Always looking for better opportunities to increase his printing skills and salary, he worked at several small printing firms in the Richmond area, and at least one picked up different aspects of the printing trade. Er, and at each one picked up different aspects of the printing trade. Realizing the limitations of a small job printing Sorry. Realizing the limitations of small job printing companies, August decided to formalize his training and served an apprenticeship under the firm of Andrews and Baptist of Richmond, who were considered to be the art printers of the South. Frank Baptist had been a printer of Confederate money and stamps during the Civil War. August learned both printing and Confederate phila philately at the firm. So... There are some vocabulary words in this that I've seen already, and feel free to ask if there are words you don't know. I will probably clarify on a couple of them in a moment anyway. Um, uh, let's see, both of which were to be lifelong endeavors. After leaving Andrews and Baptist at the age of 21 in 1890, August was employed at various printing firms for the next 10 years, 1890 to 1900 and also served in the Stuart Horse Guards, 1st Virginia Cavalry, from 1895 to 1898. In 1900, he founded the Deeds Printing Company, which rapidly became known as the South's finest printing house. While presiding over a growing art printing, <clears throat> sorry, while presiding over a growing art printing operation for the next five decades, August managed to find time for his true love of Confederate philately. The Deets Confederate States Catalog and Handbook, printed in 1932, updated in 1986, and soon to be done again in 2010. So that gives some sense, possibly, of when this bio was written. Um, remains the definitive detailed work in this area. August Deets also founded and published several philatelic journals and was founder or organizer of several philatelic societies including the Confederate Stamp Alliance, of which he was named Honorary Life President in 1950. <clears throat> While August Dietz was a philatelic renaissance man, he was also a master of the printing trade, according to a 1963 obituary for Mr. Dietz in Stamps magazine. In 1926, a newspaper editorialized that Mr. Dietz was probably the only man in America today who, with his own hands, could actually perform all stages of these printing processes, lithography, topography, steel and copper plate printing, stereotyping, and electroplating from the original sketch made by himself through the hand engraving on wood or stone or metal to the finished product. <clears throat> uh, let's see. 1932, I guess, is when that was written. Uh, he designed two new typefaces, the Dietz text and Ultimo, based on all curved lines, <clears throat> and received a patent from the U.S. Patent Office. And this last sentence here seems somewhat out of context for me. It just says, Vice Consul of the Republic of Uruguay for 30 years. I'm uncertain if that's supposed to be who wrote this, or if that is supposed to be a position that was held by August Dietz. Because that sentence doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the sentences in this biography. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we have lithography mentioned here a few times, and if anyone is unfamiliar with lithography, I will attempt to see what does the dictionary say of lithography. Um, the process of printing from a flat surface treated so as to repel the ink except where it is required for printing. So it's just a method of printing. <clears throat> um, but the word that showed up there quite a lot was philately. which is the collection and study of postage stamps. Um, and that is what August Dietz is most well known for. Hi, Key Squared. And I wonder if that's what would today be called console to rather than of. 
Yeah, and I'm not... It just seems like a very strange sentence here at the, at the end of this. I'm going to look um, real quick at our finding aid for this and see if there's any mention of Uruguay anywhere in the finding aid, because maybe, maybe it will be better or more informative. Um, No, no mention of it in our finding aid. Let me do a quick search of the Google. For the record, he was not the vice consul, as far as I know. Thank you, Kira. Uh, it just seems like a very strange sentence. I don't, unless it's possible that that is who wrote this bio. Because it's just, but, but it, it's just a very strange thing. No idea. So that is a mystery. Because it, it's just a, a strange non sequitur and there's no, no indication. I don't know the origins of that bio, which was included with the collection. So it seems like misplaced info. <laughs> I wonder if it was copied for, uh, copied text from a newspaper. And whoever did so grabbed the last line of text. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of a mystery. I'm not going to linger too long on it. It just struck me as very odd because that sentence was a, a very interesting non sequitur. But let's dive in and see what's in this collection. So, first folder is newspapers, Jeb Stewart clippings. So I'm just going to start at the very beginning because that seems like a very good place to start. <clears throat> oh, however, other recognition for his exceptional contributions to philately included a medal from the Philatelic Club of Uruguay in 1931. And that is a quote from the Dictionary of Virginia Biography. Thank you, Kira. So yeah, something. Uh, the Philatelic Club of Uruguay apparently existed and gave <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry p squared for putting an earworm in your ear <laughs> all right let me see here what i got newspaper clipping we'll see how well this shows up for you Zoom in a little bit on it. So I am by no means a scholar of or expert in the American Civil War. Um, apart from every single Boy Scout trip that I took as a kid was to Manassas Battlefield. Uh, Manassas, also known as the Battle of Bull Run, um, etc. Because that just happened to be near where I grew up. Um, and so I've seen lots of historic, like, the, the videos from the historic sites where they talk about the battles that happened in various places. I've visited buildings that look very much like the one in the photo here and seen where there are cannonballs still embedded in the walls, things like that. But I have not done a serious study of the American Civil War. Um, at least just to show you, like, he's squared, that's good. <laughs> um... And it looks like Kira has linked our finding aid as well as a longer bio in the Dictionary of Virginia Biography. I think that's what DVB stands for. Yes, Dictionary of Virginia Biography. 
um, with information on the person who compiled these materials. Um, so this collection is named the August Feast Civil War Collection because these are materials that were gathered by him and then made their way to us. So uh, here we have I Remember When by Neil November. That is a very, like, that could be like a comic book reporter's name, Neil November. Um, the north side of Carly Street between 18th and 19th Streets is a dreary, debris-strewn lot. Pieces of brick and masonry, plus old magazines and papers, cover the place. During the day, the area is a parking space. However, during the Civil War and Reconstruction, the building which stood on this lot made it the most dreaded block in Richmond. A. F. Ryden, an aged black person, walks by it now almost every day, and often he stops to gaze at the field. I used to work in the building which stood there, he says. It was a dark house with a dark history. They used to call it Castle Thunder. Ryden explained that Castle Thunder was actually an ordinary large three-story factory which occupied the center of the block. After the opening of the Civil War, that's interesting phrasing, after the opening of the Civil War, like it was a show or something. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm distracting myself. Uh, after the opening of the Civil War, this factory was converted from tobacco manufacturer into the, sh into the chief provost prison of the Confederacy. Into it were thrown Southerners convicted of looting, robbing, or murdering their fellow, fellow Southerners. Let me scooch up a little bit because I've gone past where the words that are on the screen were. As cell companions, they sometimes had deserters from the Union Army. Before long, any citizen who fell afoul of the law or military regulations ended up in Castle Thunder. Libby Prison nearby. History has perpetuated the name of Libby Prison, two blocks below Castle Thunder, as the most notorious prison, but it was Thunder and its companion across the street, Castle Lightning, that made the most fearful impression on federal troops during the war. Ryden, who worked in the building when it was re uh, reconverted to the manufacturer of tobacco, recalls that the prison com commander was a disciplinarian who spread terror among civilians by his execution of prisoners. The Congress investigated this place many times, says Ryden, because prisoners kept disappearing. I lost my place. Sorry. Civil War manuscripts tell of the investigations, but describe the hangings as having occurred with due ceremony. No large-scale escapes such as marked the history of Libby Prison were recorded at Castle Thunder. Guards patrolled the exteriors, and the prisoners were watched on the inside as well. It was whispered that whatever the command, whenever the commander heard of any plot among the prisoners to try a break, he hanged the lot of them immediately. They tell me, says Ryden, that two girls were once imprisoned there. They were really soldiers in the army, but no one ever found out they were girls. Ryden referred to Mary and Molly Bell from Southwest Virginia, who for two years masqueraded in soldiers' uniforms and were never detected. One became a corporal and the other a sergeant. So I, I pulled, I had this collection selected a long while ago and um, hadn't particularly, I, I was in a little bit of a rush, so I was like, okay, we're gonna do that one because I know that I can just pull that one and, and do it. And, and so I hadn't pulled anything for Women's History Month, but um, here we got some women's history. <laughs> um, 
when in Castle Thunder it was discovered that they were women, they were released in custody of their relatives and sent home. There was a heap of looting and robbing during the war, Ryden repeated. They tell me that salt was $2 a pound and flour over $400 a barrel. People'd rather steal it than pay that much for it, I guess. As the war progressed and prices climbed higher, Castle Thunder and Castle Lightning overflowed with characters more desperate than any imprisoned in Libby. Oh, they was a rough bunch, said Ryden, shaking his head for emphasis. They tell me that no law-abiding citizen would get near 18th and 19th or on Cary Street. When Richmond was about to be captured, Castle Thunder was emptied by the departing troops. When the Federals entered the city, they promptly filled it up again with looters and disturbers of the peace. It was then that Richmond, included, the included in Military District Number 1, saw Castle Thunder became a, become a semi-permanent prison for those who displeased the military occupation commander. <clears throat> Among the prisoners in this period was A.M. Kiley, later mayor of Richmond, who wrote editorials which riled federal troops. They used the building as a prison long after the war, said Ryden. I used to walk by here and look at the prisoners up in the windows. After the federal government released the building, it was returned to its pre-war acti activity of tobacco manufacturing. There, Ryden went to work. I guess I worked there just because I used to hang around the prison so much, he says. Anyhow, I was there until they decided to make it a warehouse. Later, they tore it down. Interesting. So I did grow up in Virginia, and I've been to a lot of, like, Civil War memorial places, like National Park Civil War stuff in Virginia. I've never seen any of the Civil War stuff in Richmond, um, so that was interesting. Oh, there's a lot of clippings in this folder. Let me show you on camera what I'm looking at here. So, it's a little envelope. And I think that's J-E-B... T-H-I... I'm not sure what that name is. Oh! No, it's just Jeb Stewart. Sorry, that is... This is the Jeb Stewart clippings folder, and that's Jeb Stewart. Um, creepy man. Who, who's creepy? Sorry. Um, and so you can see Jeb Stewart, <laughs> CSA, which would be the Confederate States of America. Uh, and then inside of this envelope is all these newspaper clippings. Stewart? You're familiar with Jeb Stewart? Because I am not, so if you are, I would happily be enlightened. These appear to be... So the, this first one here, it's really long, and I, I don't want it to fall off on the floor while I look at some of these others. It, but it's titled, Stewart's First first raid. These appear to be clippings about Jeb Stewart. <clears throat> so here you can see, I'm just gonna fold this up. I probably will not necessarily move it all the way up as I read through, but um, <clears throat> also one thing about these clippings is they don't say what paper they're from. I don't know what paper, I don't know what page. They're just newspaper clippings. So Stewart's first raid, how he inspired his soldiers. Its effect on the North. From the Comte de Paris, History of the Civil War in America. Meanwhile, a bold reconnaissance had revealed to General Lee the weak points of his adversary. On the morning of the 13th of June, a brigade of cavalry numbering 1,200 
strong and accompanied by a few pieces of artillery left Richmond under command of General Stewart. Its destination was a profound secret. Following the road to Lewis Courthouse, as if on his way to reinforce Jackson, Stewart encamped in the evening at the railway bridge of Aquia, Aquia Creek on the South Anna. Before daylight on the 14th, he turned suddenly to the right in the direction of Hanover Courthouse. The formatting there is very interesting. My understanding from past reading is that he managed to be even more racist than the average Confederate officer. He also liked burning down towns a lot. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of information here about him and oh one thing um so you see these newspaper clippings here and like it's yellowed paper this is newsprint and newsprint is very acidic um because it's cheap paper it's not meant to last like the newspapers are meant to be thrown away um and so partly for preservation purposes we, we have photocopies of all of these newspaper clippings that are actually in this folder as well. Um, I don't know if those were included in the collection when it was acquired by us, or if we made the photocopies as part of processing. My guess is that they were probably already in there. Um, but we do actually make photocopies of newspapers sometimes to help to preserve it because newspaper deteriorates over time um, so I'm not gonna sit here and read newspaper articles all the, the entire stream but I, I think this is somewhat interesting um, unsurprisingly I just ran across a thing in here about how there's a monument to Jeb Stewart see if that clipping is here somewhere. Yeah, we did not make the copies. So here we have this paper with the um, uh, this newspaper is from July 27, 1891. Jeb Stewart's Monument. It marks the field where he was mortally wounded about seven miles from Richmond, Virginia on the old Telegraph Road where stands a lone monument surrounded by broad sweeping fields. This monument standing on the field where Stewart was mortally wounded in the Battle of the Yellow Tavern was erected by some of his comrades to commemorate his virtues. Sheridan was making his famous raid in 64 trying to reach Richmond. As he advanced down the old mountain road, Stuart met him at the junction of this road and the telegraph road, just above the yellow ta tavern. And there was, and there was fought the battle of the, ah. And there was fought the battle in which Stuart saved Richmond, but gave his life. Yeah. I don't necessarily need to read memorials to Confederate generals, but um, yeah, there's newspaper clippings in here about Deb Stewart. It's interesting to me that the first newspaper item that we came across didn't seem to be about Stewart. It was about... Uh, Castle Thunder, which I found really interesting. I The buildings, I think, are some of the more interesting aspects of American Civil War history for me. But there are more folders and some actually 
really interesting things in here, um, particularly if, when we get to some of the stamp related items. Let's see, series two manuscripts, muster roll, quartermaster records, 1862 to eight, or 1862, 1865, and 1866. So those are what we'll take a look at next. I'm just gonna pull this table slightly closer to me here. As I step off camera, <laughs> there, that'll make things a little bit easier going forward, so I'm not reaching way far away. All right. First item here, I believe, will be the muster roll. And as I open this up, you'll see it, it is rather large. <laughs> Trying to show it off here. And that's only, it, it's also folded in half further beyond what you just saw there. Um, there are quite a few creases in this. Uh, so I will show it as best I can with this little document camera here. We'll zoom all the way out. Muster roll of Captain D. S. Blackburn's company. Uh, company something. Company J, possibly? of the seventy first regiment of Illinois Volunteers Army of the United States <laughs> uh, so and then it so the muster roll is is a roll. Um, there's a list of names here, when and where they enlisted, um, when they were last paid, is this column here. And so this is, um, basically taking roll, if I'm understanding correctly. This is like, uh, you've got the people who are in the regiment, and this is taking roll to make sure that they're still here and that they've been around for their pay, and um, so this would be done periodically. So like one of the notes on here, line six, we've got Jackson M. Sheets, who at the time of this muster roll was sick in the regimental hospital. <clears throat> so, the, but it, it is it is quite a large little attendance roll, and it's filled in front and back. Um, it does not want to unfold, so I'm being a, trying to be careful about doing so but like this is the full full size you would need a nice big table to be able to fill this out from June of 1862. Hmm. Let's see, what do we have here?
monthly return of quartermasters, stores received and issued <clears throat> in the month ending 31st March, 1866. So this is quartermaster stores and received, issued, and remaining on hand at Fort Wood, New York Harbor in the month of March, 1866. Note, the property on this return will be classified as follows, viz. fuel, forage, straw, stationery, barrack, hospital, and office furniture, uh, means of transportation including harness, etc., building materials, veterinary tools, and horse medicines, blacksmith's tools, carpenter's tools, wheelwright's tools, mason's and bricklayer's tools, Miscellaneous tools for fatigue and garrison purposes. Stores for expenditure such as iron, steel, horseshoes, rope, etc., etc., to be classified alphabetically. And this item is tied with a little ribbon here. Uh, and it's just filled in. We've got Doesn't appear they have any sealing wax, uh, but, and there's nothing listed for quills, but they've got 522 steel pens in the OH line, which I'm assuming is on hand. 39 pen holders. 73 office tape. 11 ink stands, 16 lead pencils, 5 paper folders, 1 eraser, 73 sheets of blotting paper, 10. yes, cute little ribbon because that's the important takeaway here. I think it's interesting that they have 16 pencils and 1 eraser. <laughs> And that they don't order more erasers. There, there's no notation here as I look at the eraser column. They're not asking for additional erasers. They just have one, and apparently that's sufficient. <laughs> Community erasers. Model parlor stoves. One. I have no idea what a model parlor stove is. Globe Stoves 20. This is very interesting to me, the kinds of things that are listed on here. This appears to be, oh, here we have means of transportation. Barges, two. They have two barges, 22 oars, two boat hooks, maybe for a traveling stove salesman? I don't know. Single block, double blocks, horses. That can't be horses. I don't know what this word is. But it, like you meet, on first glance, it looks like horses, but there's only one. It says one. There's no way they only had one horse. But this says one horse and two harnesses. One horse brush. Very interesting. <laughs> two horse rasps. One paring knife. One leather apron. Interesting. Very interesting. I could sit and look at that for a long time just because I'd be very curious about what all of the different items are. Um, 
here. Oh, you're gonna get glare. Let's see how fragile these pages are. Oh, well, they're not bad. Pull them out and be gentle with them. There was an article on salesman samples in the Journal of Antiques a couple of years ago. Well, I know we had, um, at Virginia Tech, we had a very big, like, uh, home demonstration program. Um, it's actually where some of our first female faculty became involved in the university, and um, so they're definitely, like, the demonstration samples is, was a thing, um, and I assume must have been a thing this far back as well, like the 1860s. It's just, I had not really thought of stuff like that. And this is like a regimental inventory of like supplies on hand. So I'd be surprised if it was really a demonstration item, but entirely possible. I would just be surprised because <clears throat> it's not something that I would have thought of. So here we have list of quartermasters stores and I will attempt to read this, but I might have to take it off screen to do so. List of quartermaster stores, etc., transferred by I'm uncertain of this word, Major R. L. Morgan. Assistant Quartermaster, U.S. Army, uh, transferring them to somebody, Penfield, Quartermaster, U.S. Army at Fort Hood, New York, on the sixth day of December, 1865. One hundred and four somethings. <clears throat> One hundred and four wood. I'm uncertain. But one thing that I really like about this document, even though I'm uh, it, it would take me a little bit of time and focus to really work out what all of the words are because I'm struggling a little with the um, uh, with the script. Even though it is very, very fine penmanship, I'm just struggling a little bit with making out what all of the words are. Insert Settlers of Catan joke here. Um, I am very happy to see 104 Cords of wood. Thank you, Kira. That that would make sense. Um, one thing that I'm geeking out a little bit on with this document is that it's got brown ink. And brown ink was actually quite common before World War II. Um, so today we think of like standard inks as black and red and blue and while those colors certainly were in use, uh, black especially, brown was a really common ink color um, before World War II and it fell out of fashion because it was the color that Germany preferred to use for all of their communications during World War II. Um, and so brown ink sort of fell out of favor because it became associated with official uh, German materials from World War II. And so just seeing these, and, and these both here have brown ink in use, like to me, that was the thing that stands out about them, less so the actual contents of, like the actual informational content of these. The use of brown ink is what sticks out to me, but that's solely because I like brown ink as an ink color, and I'm, I've geeked out on like the history of brown ink and, and why it fell out of fashion and stuff like that. So seeing it here, it's something that I geek out over. 
<laughs> that probably nobody else is terribly interested in, but um, one of those little little tidbits of information that sticks in my brain. See what's in folder three. We have a Confederate war bond from 1862 and a Confederate oath of allegiance from 1865. So first is the war bond. One hundred Confederate States of America loan. Number one thousand fifty five authorized in the Act of Congress, Confederate States of America of August nineteenth, eighteen sixty one. On the first day of July. And I get stuck. Let's see. On the first day of July 1871, the Confederate States of America will pay to the bearer of this bond at the seat of government or such place of deposit as may be appointed by the Secretary of the Treasury the sum of $100. With interest thereon from this date, payable the same place semi annually at the rate of 8% per, per annum on surrender of uh, the annexed warrants or coupons. This debt is authorized by an act of Congress approved August 19, 1861, entitled An Act to Authorize the Issue of Treasury Notes and to Provide a War Tax for, the redemption, for Their Redemption. In witness thereof, the Register of the Treasury, in pursuance of said Act of Congress, hath hereto set his hand and affixed the seat of the Treasury at Richmond this first day of July, 1862. And then we have the actual uh, stamps the coupons, the, the warrants or coupons as they're referred to above that would be cut off of this and turned in to redeem the interest on this bond. So Confederate States loan of August 19, 1861, the Confederate States of America will pay to bearer $4 for six months interest due July 1st, 1865 on bond number 1055 for $100. For the register of the treasury and they're they're dated so this is july 1st 1865 july 1st 1866 um another july 1st 1866 two for july 1st 1867 1868 oh sorry january 1st and july 1st my brain not not reading them so this is july 1865 january 1866 july 1866 etc. for the life of the loan. And it's on very thin paper. And you can see here somebody has um, used some tape to kind of hold it together at some point in its past. Um, It's very nicely uh, designed. Like the, the person who collected these materials was interested in the printing process and in the design of print items like stamps and, and other things. So I imagine that would have been his primary interest in this is the art design uh, here as well as any, um, like the, the subtle shading um, because this, being a bearer bond, being an actual loan document, um, would have had incorporated into it uh, 
the things that we expect of paper money today, um, all sorts of things to prevent counterfeiting of the item. Um, and so there would be printing processes in use here that were really advanced for the time um, that somebody interested in those printing processes and, and the study of stamps um, would potentially be interested in researching those kinds of uh, methods of printing that are evidenced by this document. And here we have this Oath of Allegiance. And it is Confederate's Oath of Allegiance to the U.S. So there's an envelope. There's nothing in the envelope. So we just have the document itself. There's nothing on the back. And on the front, Um, eight, headquarters, Provost, Marshal's Office. Let's see if I can zoom in a bit on this for you. I don't, I don't know why I say I'll see. I can zoom in on this a little for you, so you can see it better. <laughs> All right, headquarters, Provost's, Provost Marshal's Office, Petersburg, Virginia, April 13, 1865. I hereby certify that uh, Mrs. Mary Wilkins of Dinwiddie County, Virginia, personally appeared before me and has taken the oath of allegiance to the United States of America. And it's stamped and signed. And it, so the, the label that is written here is Confederate's Oath of Allegiance to the U.S. So... Uh, me personally not being a big scholar of um, history of the American Civil War, I take this as saying that this person who was um, part of the Confederacy had come to a legal place and sworn allegiance to the United States. which as an aspect of history was something that makes a lot of sense, but I had never thought about before. Let's see. Correspondence regarding Jefferson Davis, 1869. Oh dear, this is gonna be some more handwriting that I struggle with. <laughs> we shall see, we shall see. Let's see how, how badly it glares for you. Oh, it's not too bad. We might leave it in the browser. Lexington, Virginia, De December 11th, 1869. Dear Sir, the enclosed letter has been received from a committee of Received from a committee of something. Uh, <laughs> I tried. I did pretty good too, but I, I got a committee of something, something perimeter in New Orleans. I have consented to act as chairman of the Huh, I'm not sure what that word is. This chairman of the something committee in this country or county and as such shall be gratified if you will cooperate with me on the committee. It is not expected that individuals can subscribe largely, largely, but it is hoped 
that the aggregate from this county may be a valuable addition to the fund if the community will act with diligence Yeah, a committee of the question responsible gentlemen in, in New Orleans. Yeah, I'm not sure what the word was. I couldn't read it either. Um, a valuable addition to the fund. If the committee will act with diligence, the character of the... Gentlemen, thank you. Uh... Gentlemen, my brain was like Mothman, and I knew that was wrong. <laughs> uh, the character of the gentleman uh, composing the committee in New Orleans is believed to be a sufficient guarantee of the proper distribution of the funds collected. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other history. <laughs> Any sum collected can be uh, deposited with Mr. Bigger Cash Cashier of the Bank of Lexington, very respectfully. <laughs> you want a committee of Mothmen? <laughs> uh. I did surprisingly well at reading that. There were just a couple of words that really stumped me, but I did surprisingly well on that one. <laughs> Plus one to Mothman Committee. I mean, we're not far from West Virginia, which is where that mythology is based, right? Mothman? I don't know. I, it's been a long time since I read the Mothman Chronicles. Um, and then we have New Orleans, November 17, 1869. Sirs, Jefferson Davis has returned to this county in search of employment to support himself and family. Uh, deprived since the war of the opportunity of saving away, saving anything from the wreck of his former fortune, or of building up a new one, advanced in life with a family to maintain, and without professional training, his case appeals largely to our consideration. So, uh... Probably more efficient than a lot of committees you've served on. <laughs> so here, this letter is somebody writing about Jefferson Davis, who's looking for a job in New Orleans so that he can support himself and his family. He has no professional training, uh, but and he used to be wealthy, but now he's not because he lost the war. Um, and he's in need of money now that he's growing older and has a family to support. Um, Mr. Davis was for many years a successful cotton planter and we desire to place him again in a position where his experience as a pla planter can avail him. That is an interesting way to put it. A cotton planter. I somewhat doubt that he ever actually planted any cotton himself. But I would have to read actual biographies of him to, to glean that information, but um, I would be surprised. And they want to put him in a position where his experience as a planter can avail him. To accomplish this object without the publicity attendant him, wait, without the publicity attendant upon meeting and 
newspaper article, we invite the cooperation of prominent gentlemen like yourself at the different at the different something of Southern reputation. Not sure what that word is, but basically, you're Southern and you've got a good reputation and we're asking you to help Jefferson Davis, is what I gleaned from that paragraph. Uh, any monies obtained by our efforts for by our efforts for this Davis friend will be placed in the hands of Payne Huntington of this city. My brain is struggling with letters now. Um, long the personal friend and business agent of Mr. Davis to be used in the purchase of an estate where he can where he can reside and support his family in moderate comfort. We hope to have this fund in hand by 1st July, 1870. And it appears to be signed by about nine different people. <laughs> Wait, who? A.O. <laughs> Kinnaman, what are you talking about? He has professional training in handwriting? I really like the Spencerian script. It may be difficult to read nowadays, but it is beautiful. Yes, Philip. Um, this is, it's definitely very pretty to look at. And it's not that it's terribly difficult to read. It's just that uh, with any distance from it, it, it just, it's so small. And so trying to read it on the screen for me, um, I struggled on the screen. Plus on the screen there's a little tiny bit of glare because of the plastic, um, which is why I was leaning over and, and like getting closer to it because once I was able to actually like get physically closer, the text physically closer to my eyes, it's easier to see and make out what the letter forms are. It's actually not that difficult to read because unlike some other script from the time period, the letters actually have shape. And, and are very similar to the, the script letters that I was taught in elementary school. Um, it's just that they're really, really small. It's very controlled writing and it's very small. And so I have to like get it closer to my face to be able to make out the letters. Whereas some other script of, of the time is literally just the pen rocking up and down and it just looks like like somebody drawing, like a little kid drawing waves on a piece of paper. And you're supposed to make out that there are like an M and an O and a U and an R in there, and they all look completely identical. This has differentiation between the letters. It's, it's not that hard to read. It just takes a second sometimes to make out what it is. Um, something was mentioned about not having professional training, and I'm like, he definitely got trained in fancy handwriting. <laughs> um, well, so what, uh, A.O. Kinnaman, the, the, um, the mention of not, no formal training was about Jefferson Davis himself, and he is not the one writing this, um, but I imagine he also would have had very good handwriting, because he was a society man before he became a general, or whatever, 
he was a general, right? I don't know. He was an officer in the Confederate Army. But he was definitely a society person before that. Um, he was, as they say here, a planter, which I take to mean he owned a plantation. Um, and that tracks with what I'm remembering of Jefferson Davis from when I was a kid attending like Civil War battlefields and seeing uh, historical presentations about it, um, considering that I lived not very far from Jefferson Davis Highway. Oh, I should read the name of this folder. <laughs> William McCombs Memoir. Right, what have we got? What have we got? Property of Mr. C.C. C. Bacon. Um, from Memphis, Tennessee. William McCombs Diary, 1861 to 1865. Um, you can see here at the top, this is what happens when you have a metal, pla uh, uh, metal paper clip and things sit for a while. Uh, so this is from a rusted paper clip is what that mark is from. And then we have actual like handwriting. It, it appears to be pencil on paper. It's a little beat up. I'm gonna see if I can figure out where the start was. Wow. So the pages here are numbered. Um, at the very top of this page, there's in pencil in the center, the number one. And you can see here below, there's like page 47. Um, so I might try and read a little bit of it, but I won't be reading the text that's on screen because again, this is going to need to be close to my face for me to be able to make it out. Um, so I will leave some script up there on screen, but I'll see what I can do with this. The outbreak of the war found me in Humphreys County, Humphreys County, Nope, not working. <laughs> I don't have any idea what that word is. Lancashire? But that doesn't make sense. <clears throat> Superintending the... Something in of um, improved machinery in Mr. Andrew Barrow's mill. To enable him to make a first class grade of flour. <clears throat> I was there during the months of March and April, 1861. There was Huh. There was no good NS Marl service, telegraph or telephone. I don't know what Oh, NS mail service. Telegraph or telephone in that vicinity. Consequently, we knew very little of what was ex exciting the Southland during those months. After completing this work for Mr. Brown, I returned to my home in New Providence. Thank you, Kira, Norfolk and Southern, NS Mail, Rail, NS Rail, Norfolk and Southern Rail. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and try and read this entire diary. We did that last week, and it's surprisingly much harder than expected. There's no transcription of this text. It seems like it might be quite interesting, though, and... Um, I would definitely be very interested if somebody wanted to 
take the time and transcribe it. Um, but there are other things to look at, but I'm going to move on. We can come back to it later if, I re if we really, really want to. Um, interesting, this folder is not labeled, so I'm not sure what's in it. Let me see what the finding aid says it should be. We've got folder six. Oh, it just says August Dietz biography. So I'm guessing it'll be August Dietz biography. Uh oh, a secret folder. <laughs> The Confederate Souvenir. This does not seem like his biography. And his biography was, we found that at the beginning, and this is not it. No, oh, too much glare on that one. Um, it's not fraying very much, so I'm going to go ahead and pull it out of here. Seems sturdy enough for that. Uh, the blue and the gray. <laughs> uh, oh, and Eric has brought over the whimsies. Welcome, whimsies. Um, thank you, Eric, for the raid of 41 people. Uh, <laughs> it is lovely to see you all. Today we are looking at the August Dietz American Civil War collection. Um, he was a philatelist, which is a um, stamp collector and uh, researcher um, who was well known for his work with um, stamps from the Confederate States of America. Um, and we're looking at various items that he had collected about the Civil War. Um, yeah, so that is, that's what we're doing today. Um, hi, Diamond. Hi, Geek Outs. Um, it's lovely to have you all here. I would love it if you hang out with me while I look at these things, but uh, yeah, welcome. Um, right now we're in a mystery folder. I'm not sure what it's, what it is, because the folder was not labeled, and our finding aid says August Dietz biography, which is clearly not what it actually is. The blue and the gray. Uh... We met at Chickamauga. I had not seen him since we looked across the trenches, and his bullet made me wince. But we both shook hands in friendship, as hearty as could be, though he had marched with Sherman and I had marched with Lee. We marked across the battlefield when once the bullets flew, and the green and binding masses felt the face of crimson dew. And we talked the whole thing over when the flag was waving free, how he had marched with Sherman and I had served with Lee. The drum had ceased their the drums had ceased their beating. The saw no sabers shine. We saw no sabers shine. The hair about his forehead fell as snowy. Fell as snowy while as mine. And voices seemed to call us o'er the far eternal sea, where the men who marched with Sherman are in camp with those of Lee. Oh, Ray Fay, thank you for the bits. <laughs> um, we parted... We parted... One moment. See if I can make out this word.
We parted, eyes grew misty, for we knew that never more we'd meet until the roll call on that other peaceful shore. But both shook hands in friendship uh, as hearty as could be, though we had mar though he had marched for Sherman and I hadn't fought, or and I had fought with Lee. So it's it's a poem called "The Blue and the Gray." Um, it doesn't say who the author is. But it's about someone from the Union Army and someone from the Confederate Army uh, acknowledging one another. Um, there are a lot of things, Hannah, that are called the blue and the gray. <laughs> many, many things related to the American Civil War that are just titled or referred to as the blue and the gray. Um, it's mostly just because those were the colors of the uniforms um, and the, the colors associated with the different, uh, the two different armies. I still have no idea what, what this folder is supposed to be. <laughs> uh, we have an item here. Um, so again, I'm uncertain as to the specific reason why this was collected, um, and again, this is from this mystery folder, oh, and hopefully you'll be able to see it, because this one I definitely cannot take out of the plastic. I shouldn't have even tried. Uh, <laughs> but it is a little bit fragile, so we'll leave it in the plastic here. The Confederate Souvenir. Um... And, and so this, uh, Augustis was particularly interested in the printing methods uh, that were in use um, by the Confederacy. And um, so here we've got some more, um, e another example of printing. I don't know if that's why it was collected or not, but um, this is Honorable Jefferson Davis and First Confederate Cabinet. And my brain just remembered who Jefferson Davis was. Uh, we, we read that whole thing about how he was a former planter and down on his luck and could, could people please donate money to help support him and his family. Um, and that entire time, I forgot that he was the president of the Confederacy. <laughs> um... Yeah, so him and his cabinet. Picture of him 25 years after his inauguration. Alexander H. Stevens, first and only vice president of the Confederate States. Picture of the Capitol in Richmond. Uh, and the Capitol in Montgomery, Alabama. According to Kira, this collection is itemized, so the finding aid notes three items as folder six, which listed, each listed separately, a different way we use to note that. Okay. So the Augustis biography is meant to be in this folder and wasn't. I will make sure it makes its way back into this folder. Um, the Blue and the Gray poem and the Confederate souvenir pamphlet. Thank you, Kira, for... Uh, for Helping me with that. Concord Banner, the Star Spangled Banner, along with Francis Scott Key's poem printed in here. Interesting. I don't have a date on here. I don't see a date on here. Um, 1864. No. That's just this um, $500 bill here that's printed in here. So essentially, this is a pamphlet that's just um, was printing things that are 
remembrances of the Confederacy, like, uh, you know, an example of the money used. There's a poem here about, they called the Concord Banner, about the um, flag of the Confederacy, and then an, another one, I mean, the, the poem by Francis Scott Key that is the Star Spangled Banner, um, pictures of the president and vice president of the Confederacy, just historical information if people wanted to keep that. You oversaw the processing of the collection by a grad student. Thank you, Kira. <laughs> All right, now we have series three images. Um, this is woodcut print, 1862. And I will note there is some uh, caricature involved here uh, that is particular caricature of how black people were historically depicted by the United States or by artists in, in history. Um, so I will just note these are historic documents. And that is why we look at them, because they represent our history. Um, so here is this woodcut print. And this appears to be a pamphlet, maybe? No, no, it's just the woodcut. And so it's a cartoon, a political cartoon. The title on it is Reconstruction, What We May Expect Under Its Benevolent Influence. And I, I take it, uh, so this is a woodcut used in the Southern Illustrated News, Vir Richmond, Virginia in 1862. Um, so this is very clearly a political cartoon um, expressing uh, a view that under Reconstruction, um, white men from the South who were part of the Confederacy will be forced to work under the eye of black people. And the way it's depicted, uh, I assume that the artist intends that to be a bad thing. almost to box two, and box two has some really interesting things, <laughs> which to be frank, sounds like a pretty good idea. I agree, uh, T squared. I actually think there's nothing wrong with white people working under black people, so, but clearly whoever created that artwork felt there was something wrong with it. So this is, um, this folder is called Confederate Reunion Photos. So this is going to have photographs, which I think looking at photographs is, is interesting, especially historical photographs. Um, most of these are in plastic, so hopefully they will be viewable. American Confederate Reunion Westover, etc. This is apparently the envelope that these photos were in at one time. I don't have names, I don't have specifics, I just have photographs, but <clears throat> we'll look at them. Oops. Sorry. It moved really slowly, and then it moved really fast. <laughs> so I'm trying to do, to, trying to adjust the camera and not go at a snail's pace, but then I end up going too fast. So this appears, like, it looks like they've, 
fit on parade. I don't know what year. What year was this? No date. So we don't know when this reunion was. Some people there in their uniforms with some flags flying. They're dressed up quite a bit. So, again, these are, so this is from an event that was specifically a reunion focused on people who had been um, involved in the Confederacy. Uh, don't know the date. Um, but they've got bunting up and... and Confederate flags flying. Oh, can I read what? Based on the cars, I this can't be too far into the um, into the twentieth century. You know of West. Westover is near Falls Church, but that seems unlikely. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. And that's just handwritten onto this envelope, so it could literally be referencing anything. Um, <clears throat> the sign behind the car here is um, Arkansas Division. Um, I don't know specifically what model of car that is, but based on the cars, this has got to be early 20th century. So likely these are people that actually fought in the Civil War. Or uh, some of them at least. <laughs> And I'm uncertain as to the location. Um, it's hard to tell because the photos are mostly of the people and not of the buildings. Um, my initial guess would probably be um, that it, like, my guess would be this would be in Richmond where this was happening. <clears throat> it seems like the most likely place for an event like this. And that, so the next photo I'm going to put up, there's a monument, and it seems like a monument that would have been on Monument Row in Richmond. But I'm uncertain. Definitely the greenery and the buildings and all that, it, it definitely feels like Virginia. Um, this first section of these photos, but there seem to be quite a few more photos in this folder. Want to see what they are. And I want to make sure we get too flat to be Westover, West Virginia. Okay. So here we have, interesting. There, folder, Folder 9 was in Folder 8. That's generally not how things are supposed to be. Um, so this one is Prince of Famous Civil War Era Figures. T 
Tell me if you can see it. Yeah, there we go. So we've got Abraham Lincoln. Not a whole lot of information on the back. Let's see. And see now, uh, my problem with names and faces, like I definitely recognize this face. I can't be certain what the correct name for this face is <laughs> because uh, my brain doesn't do that very well. So, <laughs> it's a box of old white men in identical suits. Uh oh. <laughs> Here we have a picture of a city. I, it may be Robert E. Lee, but I can't be certain. So I'm, I'm un, uncertain. Um, it says Churchill, Post Office, Main Street, James River. It looked like Lee, Kira, thank you. This one doesn't tell me where, like, what the actual name of this city is. Here we have another Abraham Lincoln. Um, and yes, the the strange kind of shimmeriness. Um, is because of the type of photograph that it is. I don't know particularly off the top of my head what the name of the style of printing is that gives it that shimmer, um, but it is an aspect of these kinds of photographs. So that is actually, like you can see which part is the plastic glare and, and which part is the photograph itself. And at the right angle, you can see the picture without the shimmer but at other angles, the the actual printing process is it gives it that shimmer after a period of time. So, um, and Kira may remember the name of that printing process, but I don't. Um, but it is common, <laughs> and I'm not going to force Kira to answer all of my questions. It's just that I know she remembers these things much easier than me, and. My brain doesn't really work that way. I'll remember, I'll remember how to find the name of something, and then, then I can go look for it. But I don't necessarily remember the actual information. Early cab cabinet cards are usually albumen. Thank you, Kira. <laughs> this is just, just how my brain works. I'm like, yes, I remember details about this thing, but not what it's called. Um. So here, another photo. Again, no names, just pictures. Oh, this one has a name. Later ones, uh, collodion or gelatin. And and so yes, these would be cabinet cards, which um, I suppose we could actually tell people what cabinet cards are. Since this is the first time we've come across cabinet cards uh, do doing one of these. The ca so this is literally me reading out definitions from Wikipedia because they're going to be much more well formulated than how I would phrase it. The cabinet card was a style of photograph which was widely used for photographic portraiture after 1870. It consisted of a thin photograph mounted on a card typically measuring 108 by 165 millimeters. Uh, the carte de visite was displaced by the larger cabinet card in the 1880s. 
They're essentially the same in process and design. Both were most, most often albumin prints. Primary difference being the cabinet card was larger and usually included extensive logos and information on the reverse side of the card to advertise the photographer's services. So, yes, <laughs> so here is, here is one step ahead, uh, aka carte de visite, aka CDV. Um, yeah, these are cards. Uh, I can't read what's on the back of that one. This one has a name on the back, Admiral Franklin Buchanan, Franklin Buchanan of the Merrimack. And then uh, the next one it will be one that is actually a familiar name to lots of people, and that is John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Abraham Lincoln. And then we have a photograph of Castle Thunder, which for those of you who were here at the beginning, Beginning, we had an entire newspaper article about, but there's a description on the back of this that I will read for you. So named by Captain George W. Alexander, Assistant Provost Marshal of, of Richmond, was opened in the fall of 1862 and especially designed for the confinement of Confederate deserters, disloyal citizens, and others obnoxious to the then Confederate government. It, re rep it was represented as not being a very desirable place of residence under the regime of its tyrannical founder. So that is a, a prison from Richmond from uh, when Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. This one on the back says Lincoln and Tad. And I have no idea who Tad would be. But handwritten on the back, it says Lincoln and Tad. Let's see. Union prisoners of war at Camp Sumter, Andersonville, Georgia. Bird's eye view of the stockade. Photographed by A.J. Riddle, August 17th, 1864. Thank you, Kira, Lincoln's younger son. It's a reproduction of a famous image. <laughs> These are things, like I said, I am by far not a scholar of the American Civil War. Um, I know nothing. Maybe even a Matthew Brady. That means nothing to me, Kira. I assume that that is a, um, a famous photographer. Um, this is not my area of expertise at all. I find it fascinating and interesting to see the, the history that's in this collection, but this is definitely not um, an area that I'm an expert in. It is an area that we collect a lot of material. Um, it is one of our main collecting areas, uh, the American Civil War, um, but it is not something that that I know great deals about. So, um, so yeah, this, <laughs> um, but yeah, the war camp at, the prisoners of war at Camp Sumter. This is, So this appears to be a photograph. Oh, this is this is what was on that card earlier. The same like same city that we were looking at earlier, where that white building was labeled post office, and the James River is up in the back. Library of Congress says it's in the Brady collection, but photographer was Anthony Berger. Thank you, T squared. <laughs> Um, so this is some notes on using this photograph 
uh, for some sort of printed purpose. Um, if you have a better scene of this subject, Richmond after the evacuation, or the same scene in line drawing, use it. But so that subject is what we what we looked at earlier. Um, you happen to have the Library of Congress pages open for something else and took a look. Uh, so this is the same scene that is Richmond after the evacuation. Then there's a there's a book in here tied with a ribbon, um, and it had some very like it has like onion skin on the front. It's very 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 thin paper. Um, in fact, the back piece of onion skin has come off entirely. Um, it's not really onion skin. This is a little thicker than onion skin, but it's similar. Um, <laughs> Kira recognized it, but wrong photographer. Uh, better than Key Squared could have done without references. <laughs> yes, uh, this is why I like having Kira in the chat, because she just remembers things. Um, but yeah, so tied with a ribbon. R.L. Lee. So yes, um, that appears to be the same person that we looked at that photograph of earlier. Um, and then this, the paper in this is very rough paper. Um, it reminds me of like the, the recycled paper that we used to make by shredding uh, cotton and then turning it into paper. Um, many years of working around American Civil War collections. <laughs> Yeah, I don't interact with these collections very much. I, this is one of the first times that I've really gone in depth into one of them. Um, 1807, January 19th to 1907. Okay, so January 19th, 1907. A proclamation on the 100th anniversary of the birth of General Robert E. Lee by Claude A. Swanson, Governor of Virginia. I don't want to bend it at all, so I'm trying not to shake too much while I'm doing this for you. Commonwealth of Virginia Governor's Office. The 19th of January, 1907, will be the 100th anniversary of the birth of General Robert E. Lee, Virginia's foremost and favored son. Uh, courteous and kindly in all his acts, brave and resolute of heart, Exemplifying all Christian and knightly virtue or kingly kingly virtues, lofty and patriotic in purpose, heroic in achievement, endowed with a sharp, superb intellect and an amazing genius, he made his life a grand, glorious light that will illuminate forever the pathway of human endeavor. This is the Virginia governor, a hundred years after Robert E. Lee was born. Um being like giving glowing praise to Robert E. Lee. Interesting. Somehow I don't think that our recent governors would give the same glowing praise. Kindly is not usually a trait one associates with being a military commander, even under the best of circumstances, which um, this is not. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, all right, so now I have a box. Uh, this is box two, and you can see um, it's got the, some stuff in it. There's actually a piece of box here at the back that's used as a cushion to keep things from shifting around too much. Um, that just, the, whoever processed it, bent some box into a shape and taped it into that shape just to, to use as uh, buffering in, in the box. Um, we have some artifacts and photographs in this collection. Um, 
and the artifacts in here are interesting. They, I, I opened this box and like took a glance at them um, on Friday when I was pulling it off the shelf to, to get it ready for today. Um, yes, yes, that is just to make sure that it is, uh, we're using space filler that is archival box material. <laughs> um, so this, uh, if you remember, we looked at the the print earlier, the woodcut, the woodblock print, um, and we actually have the woodcut that was used to make that print. So hard to be on the screen. I'll angle it a little. Um, it's the one that had the so the political cartoon that we looked at. This is the actual wood block that was used to print that. So this is a Southern Illustrated News, Richmond, Virginia, 1862. And you can kind of see the size here. Uh, I can't estimate inches, maybe six inches by six inches. My brain does not do inches well. But five or six inches square. Um, somebody carved it out and it was used to print the, the political cartoon that we looked at earlier. So we have that. Just a few more things here. Oh wow, I just saw what time it is. <laughs> Looked at all these things and um, the postage stamps of the Confederate States of America. We didn't even get to the postage stamps. Um, Frank Baptist in 1862. Um, so these are, are printed cards. This was the spe particular specialty of August Dietz, um, who did a lot of study, um, has been referred to as the father of Confederate philately, um, but he, he is one of the most known scholars of Confederate postage stamps. Um, and these are some printed cards giving information on different Confederate state stamps. So here we have the five cents blue stamp with some uh, a picture of it as well as some information. Um, another five cents blue. 1862 two cents green stamp and so if you're interested in stamp collecting and um, philately generally uh, part of August Dietz's interest in philately was the printing process he was a printer um, and was interested in the actual art of the stamps um, but also just for uh, stamp collectors and, and enthusiasts, um, Confederate stamps are something that is a topic of collecting. Um, and so having access to the, the material and the, the research of August Dietz particularly um, would be something that stamp collectors would be very interested in, the, the research that he did, the work that he did in studying Confederate stamps. Um, and so there's some examples of stamps in here. I don't know that we have it. I don't think we don't actually have like actual stamps because they would be worth more money than this uh, collection is. 
see if there's anything else in here that I want to make sure to show. Um, yeah, not particularly. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I've had fun looking through um, the stuff in this collection. I think it's, it's all very interesting. Um, if you're at all interested in uh, the history of the American Civil War, Special Collections and University Archives here at Virginia Tech does have a uh, rather substantial collection of material on the American Civil War. Feel free to go to the Virginia Heritage website. Um, that is vaheritage.org. This is me trying to remember. Uh, yeah, here is something like 400. Yes, VA vaheritage.org um, and you can search through our finding aids there to see what we do have um, and we are open to the public um, there's information on the library's website about uh, services for the community um, and included in that is a link to the special collections website where you can learn about how to come and visit us um, if you do want to physically come here and visit and look at our collections, um, I'm going to switch back to talking view since I don't have any documents out there. Um, next week, I found a collection that I'm quite excited to look at. Uh, next week, we are going to look at the Anne E. Moss papers, uh, 1920 to 1990. Um, I will read some biographical information about Anne Moss, uh, who we will be visiting next week through her papers. Uh, Anne Moss, née Dressler, was born in New York City in 1903. She took singing and dancing lessons in high school and, became, and began performing on the stage by the time she graduated. She married Harry Moss, a theatrical agent, in 1922. She spent the years between 1922 and 1930 as Ziegfeld Follies Chorus Girl in such productions as The Three Musketeers, Garrick Gaieties, and Funny Face. Moss also modeled for New York Daily News advertisements. In 1927, she gave birth to her only daughter, Marilyn, also known as Alwyn. In 1928, she refused to audition in the nude for producer Earl, Car Earl Carroll's show Fioretta brought charges against Carol before Actors' Equity, the Theater Union, and won the case in January 1929. And so the, the collection itself um, consists of photographs, news clippings, correspondence, library manuscripts, or literary manuscripts, and playbills collected or created by Moss from the 1920s to her death, copies of two unpublished novels, as well as several of her shorter writings. News clippings include editorials from New York papers regarding Moss's lawsuit against Earl Carroll, and the photographs included, uh, include many where she appears as a character from the various plays in which she performed, as well as several portrait poses. So next week we will be looking at the Anne, uh, sorry, at the Anne Eve Moss papers. I'm excited by that. Um, I was just randomly looking through finding aids and discovered that we had this collection from someone who was a chorus girl in the Ziegfeld Follies who eventually retired here to Blacksburg uh, to be with her children, um, which I'm assuming is part of why this collection is here, is because she ended her life in this area. Um, so I'm excited. That is what we will be exploring next week, and I'm going to go ahead and set up a raid um and let's see i think i'm gonna send us over to the aquarium again today um they're a really chill stream to watch um i know they put out something recently thanking people for supporting them by continuing to watch over the past year um saying how much that has helped them to stay uh, stay open despite the fact that they have not been open to the public since march of last year this is the Monterey Bay Aquarium that I am particularly referring to. Um, and so I'm going to send you all over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium um, to enjoy the shark cam. Uh, and I will see you here next week and we'll look at the records of a former chorus girl from the Ziegfeld Follies. Thank you, everybody.